27. Meadow Grove, Caledonia, Sky March, Federated Commonwealth, 2048 hours, 16th of April, 3057. Marshal Felix Zellner was climbing down out of his mech, a recently refurbished Atlas that had been outfitted as his personal command mech. After his survey of the battlefield from the church tower earlier, he'd come down to the base camp set along the new Edinburgh Road south of Falkirk. There, he'd climb into the mech, sitting there for the next hour while trying to monitor the evolving battle and with every passing minute he was growing less sure of himself. His expeditionary force was becoming increasingly strung out. Its right flank was anchored by the woods and the mech reserve, but fully half of their mechs were some three kilometers away, off on the left, and too far to immediately support the right if there was trouble. Seymour was gone, off in his stalker to check on the battalion. The battle along the ridge line to the south, meanwhile, had been gradually dying away, as gunners reported fewer and fewer hostiles to fire at across the clearing beyond. Zeller had sent a company forward to probe the woods to the south, but so far there'd been no report back, and he expected none for some minutes yet. There was no sign of the expected attack around the left flank either. The Max Malishnikov had reported an hour ago had failed to materialize. Were they still there? In camping for the night for an attack at dawn? Or had it been a feint? And now, this. The soldier was muddy and disheveled, his face filthy, his eyes wide and bright in the deepening twilight. He also was breathing hard, as though he'd been running hard and fast. One of Zellner's staff officers had brought him over just a moment before. Just how many enemy mechs did you see, anyway? Zellner demanded. I, I, ain't I ain't sure, sir. Lots, though. More than a company. And they were heading this way at a full run. Fool! If they were running, how did you get here first? The man turned and pointed west. The sunset sky was a brilliant red and orange beyond the blue-black shadows of the Tanglewood. I came straight through there. They was moving up the road to the north. I don't know. Maybe they stopped to form up. Maybe they're moving through the woods now, slow-like. But they're there and they're coming, Marshal. Damn me if they ain't. A crackle of gunfire sounded to the west, and the insistent yammer of a machine gun. Zellner kept staring into the forest, as though willing himself to see through the impenetrable wall of trees. What was going on out there? The man had seen something that was certain. His was the fifth report in the last ten minutes, reports by infantry scouts and his communication staff, and by one Mercury still on picket duty on the Tanglewood Road. The Mercury's report had ended in mid-transmission, with no clear warning of anything but something moving on the road, and Zellner had assumed a radio failure. Now, though, it was clear that the enemy units were moving out there. But a company or more? It didn't seem possible, not given what was known about the Great Death's numbers on Caledonia. And at night? Ridiculous. The likeliest explanation, especially in light of the reports of large numbers of mechs moving to the east, was that a few mechs, possibly a recon lance of stingers and locusts, had been deployed through the Tanglewood, either to act as fire observers for the main attack or to serve as decoys, a diversion to pull Zellner's main strength back to Meadow Grove. Something broke from cover, skittering across the open ground. Now what? There was another, and another. In a moment there were hundreds of the things, small brown or black-furred animals of some kind, leaping and bounding swiftly as they dashed out of the woods and across the open ground toward the east. Zellner turned slowly, surveying the area. He was in the main encampment, where dozens of battle mechs had been drawn together for servicing, arming, and preparation for the battle everyone expected in the morning. The infantry camp lay to the west, tucked in next to the woods, and he could see against the shadows of the trees dozens of campfires lit by men preparing evening meals. Further north was the supply dump. 
and row upon row of parked vehicles, supply trucks, ammo carriers, and suddenly it all seemed terribly, terribly vulnerable. More of the furred animals crashed out of the underbrush, running frantically. Something sure had scared them back in the woods. The first great death battle mech emerged from the forest less than a hundred meters from Zellner's position, striding out from among the trees and into the middle of the infantry encampment. Soldiers bolted and ran, a few in armor, some wearing fatigues or even underwear. The mech, a locust, strode through the camp with the look of some ugly demonic insect eight meters tall, balanced on two slender legs that stilted across campfires and tents and scattering men. Zellner could see the black and gray skull emblem painted on its upper works. The mech's twin laser mounts opened fire, and men began to fall. To his own surprise, the appearance of the locust steadied Zellner. A twenty-ton scout machine? Was that all? His atlas could kick it to the next continent. Swiftly he climbed back up the access ladder, struggling to reach the safety of his cockpit, before the locust came closer. Along the line of the woods now, other mechs were emerging. Alex saw the trees thinning ahead, and urged his archer along faster, crashing through the smaller trees and saplings, squeezing once between two larger trees, partly uprooting both as his seventy-ton machine forced them apart. An explosion erupted ahead and to the left, machine gun fire chattered. Shifting briefly to IR imagery, Alex saw dozens of small, bright blobs of life scurrying ahead of his footsteps. Small Caledonian animals of some kind, startled by the onslaught of Max, and sent fleeing ahead of the attack and out of the woods. I'd run too, Alex silently told the fugitives, if I had this bunch on my tail. His primary monitor showed two mech formations to the north and south of the Tanglewood Road, arrayed six and six each. Alex was with 3rd Bat's 3rd Company, the Grey Raiders. The unit CEO, Captain Gallery, was maneuvering his Shadowhawk through the woods to Alex's left. Sergei Golovanov, in his Marauder, was crashing ahead to his right. Alex shifted course slightly, moving a bit closer to Shooter Gallery putting a bit more distance between himself and the Marauder's PPC, as well as providing additional fire support for the lighter Shadowhawk. Then he was through the final line of trees and bursting into the open. It was twilight, with the sky still a pale and radiant green-blue, and both of Caledonia's moons hanging in the southern sky. He'd emerged two hundred meters south of the road, and almost squarely in the center of a camp. Tents were strewn about everywhere, some still standing, many knocked down either by mechs or by fleeing troops. Bruce Lazenby's locust was moving ahead, dragging the white canvas of a tent that had snagged on his mech's left foot. A few hundred meters ahead, the gantry rigging and portable cranes of a small mech maintenance area showed where the 3rd Davian Guard had positioned its reserves. Several artillery pieces were drawn up behind sandbag parapets, aimed at a point well above the ridge to the south. Several nearby third guard mechs turned to face the sudden strike from their right and rear. A Jaeger mech was caught in a crossfire by Sergeant Hank Corby's victor and Golovanov's marauder, twisting back and forth in a horrible parody of a dance as laser and particle beams stabbed and slashed through its armor. Then Corby cut loose with its Gauss rifle, and the crack of the ferrous-encased depleted uranium, breaking the sound barrier, echoed across the landscape. The round struck the Jaeger mech in the left side, peeling back a wad of armor as big as the mech's arm, and exposing the sparking, flashing leads and circuitry of its internal wiring. As another fossilade of laser fire struck home, the dome top of the Jaeger mech's squat torso popped open in a cloud of smoke, and an instant later the pilot rocketed clear, his ejection seat propelled skyward by a battery of powerful jets. Alex noted the mech's destruction, but had no time for more than a glance as the Jaeger mech exploded into orange flame. He was already tagging targets for his LRMs, the artillery park first, followed by the field maintenance area. 
The more Third Guard Max he could put out of action while they were still standing there helpless, without their mech warriors, the better. Pivoting right, the protective cowlings on both of the archer's LRM batteries folding back, Alex planted both of his mech's feet solidly in the ground, then loosed a shrieking school of deadly Doombot LRMs. Their contrails arched away through the sky, descending on and around the long-range artillery pieces, which until that moment had been continuing to hurl high explosives over the ridge to the south. Explosions blossomed among the artillery pieces. The tree-trunk-sized barrel of a 155mm cannon spun end over end as it flew straight up in the air, hesitated a moment, then plunged earthward into the expanding smoke cloud of its carriage's destruction. The blasts continued after the last of Alex's rockets struck. Secondary explosions were touched off among stored munitions behind the sandbag revetments. Abruptly, the store of artillery bombardment rockets detonated, and an acre of Caledonian earth heaved up into the sky, overturning guns, smashing munition tractors and transport crawlers, and mowing down the gunners as they sought to escape. Pivoting his torso left, Alex zeroed in next to the massed battlemax at the maintenance area, loosing another LRM salvo, then a third and a fourth, as his tubes loaded automatically. As explosions ripped through the facility, shredding the lightweight structures of the gantry towers and the heavier traveling crane mounts, one stinger toppled slowly forward, crashing full length onto the ground as the magnetic grapples holding it in place gave way. A moment later, a hatchetman, with its rather ludicrous and clumsy hand weapon, was torn open from throat to hip by a succession of internal explosions, and then part of the gantry support behind it came toppling down, smashing the vacant mech to the ground beneath a pile of twisted smoking wreckage. A fuel tank nearby erupted with crimson and orange savagery, lighting up the darkening plain as the fireball climbed into the evening sky. By this time, the other mechs of Task Force Striker had moved well past Alex's position, smashing headlong into the Davion mechs, both manned and unmanned, scattered about the rear area. To Alex's practiced eye, it appeared that Stryker had emerged from the Tanglewood, squarely behind the Davion right flank, with few of the enemy mechs even facing the woods or otherwise prepared for an attack from that direction. Turning to face the ridge to the south, he triggered the two flare guns mounted outside his archer's head. With a dull pop-pop, two brilliant green stars clawed their way into the sky a signal to his father that the attack had succeeded as a complete surprise. The third Davion Guard's mechs were still advancing slowly down the slope from Cemetery Ridge, occasionally stopping to probe the woods in front of them with fire. Receiving no fire in return, they kept moving. Hidden in the woods, less than a kilometer away now, Grayson, Major Fry, and the rest of the 3rd Bat's 1st Company waited, weapons ready, crosshairs and targeting cursors already laid on their chosen prey. Abruptly, two green flares crawled up from behind the ridge, arching toward the zenith in emerald glory, brilliant against the darkening twilight. There it is! Grayson cried over the general tactical channel. That's Alex! He did it, Davis added. The lad did it. Thank God, Caitlin de Vries added with heartfelt intensity. Someone in the waiting fire team cheered. Stow it, Grayson warned. Stand by. No one fires until I give the word. Third Bat's first battle mech company, the Firestormers as they called themselves, normally consisted of twelve mechs, divided among command, fire, and combat lances, but losses in their recent campaign on the old Commonwealth border with the Draconis Combine and on the edge of clan space had not been completely made up, and they now numbered only eight. To reinforce the company, Grayson added his own supernumerary Command 1-1 lance, consisting of himself and his victor, Davis McCall's Highlander, and Caitlin de Vries's Griffin. 
Also present as supernumerary was Captain Walter Dupre, the warrior who still didn't have a unit to fit his rank, but who'd been attached to Grayson's personal staff until a slot opened up. Dupre's ponderous 80-ton Zeus had taken up position among the trees to Grayson's rear. Irritated, Grayson opened up a private channel. Captain Dupre, what the hell are you doing back there? Move up. I want those people to feel our steel. Uh, yes, sir. We fight as a lance. No one hangs back. I wasn't hanging back. Just get in line. Take your position and don't move. It'll go down pretty quickly now. The eight mechs of the Firestormers were mostly on the heavy side, including Lang's Shadowhawk, a Marauder, a Jaeger mech, two Catapults, a Guillotine, a Vindicator, and a Hunchback. The addition of Command 1-1 made the unit a motley and mismatched gang, ranging from the 45-ton Vindy to McCall's 90-ton monster of a Highlander. The twelve mechs they were facing were lighter for the most part. The leader appeared to be another victor, but the others included two locusts and a mercury in an advanced recon position, three centurions, two wolfhounds, and three assassins. Grayson's combat computer had long since tallied the raw numbers. The twelve great death mechs added up to 790 tons, while the approaching company strength patrol totaled just 480 tons. It wasn't at all wise to predict the outcome of a battle solely on the respective total weights of the two sides, but the fact that the hidden Great Death Company so significantly outmassed the other, and the fact that they were attacking from ambush virtually guaranteed an immediate victory. The problem was that when the Legion's mechs attacked, they would reveal just how few of them were in place in the woods opposite Cemetery Ridge a vital bit of combat intelligence that would be immediately relayed back to the guard headquarters. There was no way Grayson knew of to simultaneously silence all twelve enemy mechs. Some were bound to escape. Any could broadcast the critical data in the minutes it would take to destroy them. Grayson had in fact been considering ordering his line to melt back into the woods to avoid contact altogether, but that would have risked the serious danger of the twelve legion mechs becoming separated in the treacherous labyrinth of the Tanglewood, and the even greater danger of being fired on by friendly mechs in the wilderness. Seeing Alex's signal had decided him, however. With Alex attacking their rear, by now the gods had other things to worry about than how many mechs were in Grayson's tiny command. The thought was reinforced by a glance toward Cemetery Ridge. A greasy black pall of smoke was rising now against the evening sky, red-lit from beneath, and the sound of multiple explosions could be heard in the distance. Get em, Alex! He breathed softly. The Davion mechs were much closer now, less than two hundred meters away. They were picking their way slowly through the torn and ruptured ground in front of the woods, an area plowed by dozens of high-explosive shells and rockets from the Davion artillery base. The locusts and the lone mercury trod mincingly across the broken ground, now within one hundred meters. The others hang further back, possibly sensing a trap, possibly receiving new orders from their command center. Much longer, and they might be ordered back. But now they were close enough. Fire! As one, the Grey Death battle mechs, hidden in the woods, opened fire on the advancing mech company. Grayson had carefully passed the word to the others to hold their fire, deliberately luring the approaching patrol well into the killing ground of the waiting mechs interlocking fields of fire. One of the locusts went down almost at once, its slender leg shot through by a laser burst from a legion marauder. An assassin was pinned in the intersecting laser beams from Lang's Shadowhawk, Gonzalez's guillotine, and Sharon Kilroy's vindicator. Thomas Vandermeer's hunchback began to steady slam, slam, slam of a heavy cannon fire from the Kali Yama autocannon. The shells slashed viciously into a centurion, driving it back step by step, shredding armor from its shoulder and side in great chunks that spun smoking through the air. 
So devastating was that first volley that there was no immediate response from the ambush victims. Two of their numbers were down, then three, then a fourth, a second assassin hammered down by rocket fire from the two big catapults. Finally, the survivors began returning fire, but slowly and with evident confusion, sending rounds and laser beams searing through the trees, but for the most part firing high or between the lurking legion Max. Grayson concentrated his fire on the biggest enemy mech, a victor that might have been his identical twin, except that its armor looked newer and less scarred, the paint was brighter, the hull numbers fresher. No matter. Grayson slammed two gauss rounds into the other victor at close range, one after the other, then followed up with a barrage from both lasers and a salvo of SRMs. The other victor, staggered by the sheer devastating power of the Gauss rifle onslaught, stumbled and went down. Rising, it brought up its own Gauss rifle, seeking a target, then firing with a shattering thunderclap that fell the tree three meters to Grayson's left. Grayson fired his Gauss again, before the enemy victor could recharge, striking the other high in its right shoulder, tearing away a chunk of its heavy pauldron. The other Davion Max, those that could still walk, were scattering, running back the way they'd come, their formation broken. Grayson strode from the woods, firing at the retreating guard Max. The enemy victor, still holding its ground, fired both lasers, the coherent light washing across Grayson's armored torso in a scintillating burst of reflected light. The other Max seemed to be having trouble with its Gauss rifle, however. Twice, it raised the heavy muzzle of the weapon to aim directly at Grayson's cockpit, then twice lowered it again, as though the pilot had tried to trigger the weapon and failed. Abruptly, the enemy mech turned, flexed its knees, and leaped into the air, jump jets shrieking, leaving a swirl of superheated air and burning grass to mark its passage. Forward! Grayson called. General advance! It was Pickett's charge at Gettysburg again, with Grayson advancing up Cemetery Ridge, with eleven mechs strung out to either side and behind him, the enemy already in complete rout, streaming away and up the slope of the ridge. He could see other mechs atop the ridge, wavering uncertainly. From that vantage point, they must be able to see both Grayson's small line to their front, plus the large number of mechs in Striker coming down on their rear. The explosions flashing and erupting along the crest of the hills ahead indicated that Alex must be hitting them from the far side with everything he had. An old-fashioned charge right now, right here, just might break the enemy's will to keep fighting. A salvo of SRMs streaked across the intervening space from the ridge, angling toward the torso of Grayson's victor. Grayson flexed his max knees, then leaped triggering his jump jets in a fiery burst of superheated steam. He rose into the sky as the missiles howled past. One exploded harmlessly against his side armor, the others missed, passing beneath him. Slowly, majestically, his victor soared across the plain toward the top of the ridge. He would never make it all the way, of course, but his first jump ought to take him about a quarter of the way out of the woods. This, at least was one advantage the victor had over the marauder. It could jump, though Grayson often thought that the weight and control systems devoted to the jump jets could have been better spent on additional weapons for the victor. To left and right, others of the company charged forward, those with jump jets using them to vault ahead, those without breaking into a lumbering run up the gentle slope. The company was widely scattered now, the better to avoid making a tempting target for enemy gunners on the ridge top. The victor was losing energy, starting to descend. Grayson positioned his legs for a landing, spreading them slightly apart, knees flexed. He hit and heard a sharp bang from somewhere below in the same instant. Red lights flared across his console, warning of a critical failure in his right leg hydraulics. He was losing pressure down there, and fast. He recovered from the landing, took one step, and suddenly the ground was rushing toward his mech's cockpit. 
He crashed into the ground, the impact jarring him, hurling him forward and down against the straps that pinned him in his seat. Right leg hydraulics and control systems, down. The victor's knees had been giving it trouble for years, but never anything like this. He must have blown the whole hydraulic pressurization system and shorted out the Myomer cyclics. Warning lights announced catastrophic failure of his right leg. Hell, as near as he could tell, his mech didn't have a right leg anymore. His victor, lying full length on the ground, began bucking and thumping with multiple impacts. There was a devastating slam as something big hit him in the back, and suddenly miniature lightning bolts were dancing across his console. Grayson gasped, then screamed as an electric charge surged through his body. The pain was mercifully brief, cut short when the power to his cockpit systems failed, but it left him numb, feeling bruised all over. He couldn't move his legs. Another thump, more violent this time, and fresh lightnings arched past his cockpit window. A PPC round? From behind? Desperately, Grayson tried to engage one of his monitors to get a view in that direction, but nothing was working. Nothing. The victor's cockpit was dark save for the glow of emergency battery-powered lights and the erratic wink of dozens of red warning lights on the console. Warning, warning, a computer voice said with a grating calm. Fire in capacitor bank three. Grayson was hanging face down, dangling from the safety harness of his cockpit seat. Smoke was filling the cockpit, and one of the few operational readouts on his console was the ominous red bar showing mech internal temperature next to several flashing warning lights warning of fire. Damn! Who had attacked him? All primary systems were out, dead. He couldn't eject, not lying flat like this. He would have to scramble clear through the escape hatch. Would his legs hold him? Feeling was returning, a hot tingling sensation, but he wasn't sure he'd be able to stand up. Warning, warning, fire in the cockpit, fire in the cockpit. He would crawl if he had to. The smoke was becoming so thick, he could scarcely see his console in the hesitant light, but there was a growing warmth to the smoke, and a hint of a flickering yellow glow. His helmet was not airtight, and he began choking on the acrid fumes. After struggling to disconnect his neurohelmet cables, and then unhooking his seat restraints in the close space of the cockpit, Grayson twisted around and yanked on the emergency hatch release. There was a small explosion, and the hatch popped open, admitting a rush of cool, sweet, fresh air. He pushed himself through, his legs dangling uselessly behind him, as he hauled himself halfway through the small round hatch. A mech loomed out of the rear darkness, just thirty meters away. In the gloom, he could still make out its outline easily against the pale twilight sky. A Zeus! Walter Dupre's Zeus. With a harsh whine of servo motors, the fearsome assault mech raised its left arm to aim its massive particle projection cannon directly at him.